Hello and welcome to this, the sixth session of our series Foundations of the Faith. If you remember, this series was created with the purpose of presenting to everybody the foundational truths that make Christianity a worldview that is based on the scriptures. A couple of weeks ago, the week before last, we started this topic of the war of the mind. This internal fight that we all have, every human being, no matter what culture, no matter what age, no matter what sex, we all have this internal fight that we're continually struggling with, and it's all up here in the mind. And we talked about how this war is first and foremost with ourselves, with our flesh, with our desire. We talked about how every human being has this animal-like instinct that we are either dominated by or we dominate over. And these instincts, obviously, for somebody that is not a believer, somebody that is not being born again, someone who has not got the help of God in his life or her life, it is impossible to be in control of this flesh. But for a believer, it's a different story. The Holy Spirit of God brings the person into a place of governing, having control over, conquering the flesh, the desires of the self, taking away uh, the, per the personality of, of selfishness and then putting God at the center of their lives and then thinking about other people. Last week we talked about the second part of this war of the mind and we talked about the devil. What does the Bible say about the devil? We said that the devil is a spiritual force. He is an influencer who comes to make people or, or lead people into things that are against God. They are against what is right, what is just, what is pure, what is holy. The Bible talks about the devil in many different places and, and, and talks about him as if he was a serpent or a deceiver or a, a thief or a liar. Someone who is completely against, who opposes God who's there continually attacking or else accusing believers in order to bring confusion and deterring their walk of faith. We said that in order to stand against uh, the attacks of the devil, a believer must stand firm in his or her faith. The believer must stay awake and be alert uh, to be able to, to move away from those a dart that the devil throws at him or her. The person must resist the devil because the Bible promises that if one submits to God to resist the devil, the devil flees from our lives. Obviously, uh, prayer, the, a good understanding of the Bible in itself, the Holy Spirit of God, the fasting are some really important things that we can use in order to destroy these strongholds that sometimes are there in our lives or else things that the devil has sort of bombarded on a very particular weak spot perhaps in our mind in our heart that we have these tools available to us that we can make the most of them so that we can destroy every argument that exalts itself against the knowledge of god and today we're going to finish this topic the war of the mind and we want to finish talking about the world so, if you remember, part of what we said last week with regards to the devil will kind of mix, if you like, with uh, today's message because the scripture says that the devil is the prince of this world. So, we'll talk about how the devil uses his ways to influence us through the world, through the systems that are in place in this world to distract us or to move us away from what is true, from what is honest, from what is right, from what is holy, from what is obviously from God. So, but before we start, let's just take a minute and pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity once again to share your word with everyone who listens to this message. Father, I pray that you would indeed bless us, that you would give us understanding that you would open our eyes to the spiritual realms that we'll be able to see what this world throws at us and how it is designed to distract us from the truth, from your righteousness, 
from following you, from having peace and joy and faith, the very things that you created us to have relationship with you and with others. So, Father, help us to understand how can we fight this war in our minds? How can we stand against everything that this world throws at us? Help us today, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So I want to start today by reading a very interesting passage in the Scripture that you can find in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 4. And it's the known temptation of Jesus in the wilderness or in the desert. Book of Matthew, chapter 4, verses 1 to 11, it reads, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting forty days and forty nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, Again it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these I will give to you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. So what we have here is Jesus as a man having a spiritual war. A war that was happening obviously in his heart, in his mind, as he was there alone in the desert. He could hear the voice of the devil bringing all of these temptations. Bringing him this temptation to satisfy his flesh by turning some stones into bread. And Jesus did not succumb to this temptation of the flesh, but rather conquered over his hunger. He also, the devil also brought Jesus to a place where he could tempt God by throwing himself out of the pinnacle of the temple as if a display of his uh, godliness, if you like, is, is trying to make a spectacle so that the people will see the angels will indeed come and rescue him. And Jesus said, no, I am not going to do this. I'm not going to uh, allow pride or anything to show off in the time that is not according to the purpose of his father. And finally, what we read in verses 8 onwards, The devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And this is where we're going to focus uh, today, the idea of the world. It says here that the devil brought Jesus to a very high mountain and showed him everything, all in the horizon, everything that Jesus' eyes could survey. And the devil said to him, I will give you all of these kingdoms and glory, etc., if you fall down and worship me. And this is when Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. And one may ask, how come the devil could offer Jesus the kingdoms and the power and the glory of this world? Isn't Jesus the one who is in control of the world? Yes, he is. The Bible says that everything was created by him and for him. But the scripture also says that God threw Satan out of heaven and he, in a way, now roams around the world taking advantage of his position as a spirit to influence people. In the book of 1 John chapter 5, verse 19, it says that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. 
in John 12, 31 or John 14, 30 or John 16, 11, he says that the ruler of this world is Satan. In Ephesians 2, 2, when Paul is addressing the believers at Ephesus, he says to them that they formerly walked according to the course of this world. What does that mean? It is according to the prince of the power of the earth the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Hmm, that's interesting. We're going to go back to something about this power that operates in the world in a minute. In 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 says, it says that the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelieving people so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So the Bible clearly teaches that the devil has some sort of authority or some sort of rule or dominion over the world. But what world are we talking about? So this is where we need to define clearly the difference between the world that God created and the system that is the one in which the devil rules and is his playground. So when we say the world, we're not talking about plants and animals and mountains and rivers and valleys waterfalls and stuff like that that was created by God and until today these beautiful things that are on this earth are just a reflection of God's character of his goodness of his creativity of his love of his provision the whole world testifies creation that is that God is present that he exists and that he upholds everything in his hand so the world belongs to God because he created it it is His, and the world itself gives glory and testifies of God. But when the scripture talks about the world in the concept of the system that rules people and the things that happen in the world, that is when we say that the devil is the one that has control over this system that runs and governs all things that happen in the world. So we're talking about governments, we're talking about people striving for power and authority, money, 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 businesses and big cars and big houses and the pride of this world and everything that promises uh, freedom and, and the things that you see in the shop windows and, and in the internet and every time you open a magazine, everything that is offered to you, everything that this world wants to give you, the glory of this world, that is what we're talking about. So why is it that it's important for us to understand this? Well, because one of the main, if not probably the main thing that will be continually striving in someone's mind to catch their attention, to be continually in the forefront, continually distracting, moving away, or probably um, you know taking the person to in a different direction, is precisely the world. The world and everything that is in it is a source of distraction for people not to look for God and not to look for His righteousness, holiness, sanctity, a life of godliness and peace and joy. As we all know, television, newspapers, magazines, the internet, social media, everything, everything is built in order to send you messages, to capture your imagination, your desires. Everything is created in order to make you consume, buy, go places, do things, absorb something, take uh, ownership of something or else become someone who pays a monthly fee or a yearly fee or another subscription. Everything out there is commercialized in a way that is all designed to influence your life. Now we are all under the same influence, both believers and unbelievers, Christians and non-Christians. We all live in the same world and this world, obviously according to whatever country you live in, uh, will affect the way you perceive life, the way you see uh, those around you, the way you live everyday life. Commercials and clothes that you see in the shop windows, they all want to sell. Technology, 
uh, the, the new gadget, the, the, the new style of, of perhaps clothing or hairdo uh, is, is the new thing now, the music, uh, you know, everything that is out there is designed to show you that you can get whatever you want whenever you want it obviously as long as you have the money for it everything the money can buy is all designed to be like a trap it's a purposefully designed trap and nowadays even the information that we share in the internet is passed from one person to another from one company to another to a third party and that's why you get bombarded with emails and offers and and you know every time you browse your computer you will find for example that they're targeting you specifically in, in according to whatever search you you had in, in one of these um, web search pages you know whatever it is that you buy or that you look and you spend time looking at in the internet they keep track of everything in order to sell you the new offer the new gadget the new this the new that everything is designed in order to enslave us into this so-called rat race many people um, nowadays talk about the so-called rat race and how to get out of it um, but you see the rat race is nothing else apart from the system or, or rather becoming part of the system becoming like a, a, a cookie that has taken the shape of the cookie cutter the rat race is nothing else than just someone adapting and taking on the same pattern, the same style as everyone else. Going to work from say 9 to 5 or 8 to 4 and then coming home and doing the same thing on and on and on and on week in and week out and then just enjoying the weekends and going down the pub and having another drink and probably watching football and then probably buying something in, 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 in Amazon or whatever um, you know because it's convenient and probably drinking a coffee in a particular brand of coffee shop or you know wearing a particular clothing because it has a little logo somewhere or you know driving a particular type of car everything absolutely everything uh, that this world has to offer is what becomes the so known rat race and it's, it's like a trap it's like the, the image of the donkey or the horse that is uh, chasing the carrot. The carrot is sort of dangling, uh, the, is, is hanging off of a stick that is just close enough so that the horse or the donkey feels like they are just about to bite it. And maybe at certain times they are able to give it a bite, but that is just enough to keep that animal moving forward he's, he's never really going to be able to bite the whole thing and eat the whole carrot and even if he does maybe another carrot will appear so that he will continue plowing or he will continue moving forward so that he would not stop and this chase is relentless it's just on and on and on and on so close yet so far and everything that this world offers everything that this world offers is just vanity everything I mean you will have to probably go to a country like Cuba for example that has been under different rule for so many years and you get to see what people really need in order to live and it's the bare minimum but you come to countries like Europe some countries in Europe where everybody, I mean, people leave stuff in parks and in park benches and they forget stuff and, and, you know, people pick it up and put it there for someone else to, you know, collect later. People have no need. People are even wondering, what should I give my uncle or my brother or my sister or my mom for their birthday or for Christmas because they don't need anything. So in these kind of countries where consumerism has become the rule, the norm, is simply because the world has been, the stamp of this world has been uh, penetrated into the society in such a way that people just adapt, people just accept. It's like 
uh, 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 an insurance policy, perhaps, uh, that offers you all the covering that you think that you need. But then when it comes to the actual claim, oh, by the way, um, we don't have this. Oh, by the way, uh, that was not included in your policy. Oh, by the way, uh, you know, it's, it's every single illness except the one that you, uh, that you have. Or, you know, you, your, your car policy includes all of these damage except. And that is exactly what this world does. They offer you everything, but they never deliver true meaning, true satisfaction. You know, you have people nowadays like uh, fitness or, or financial gurus that they are continually posting these videos that if you follow their recipe or if you do what they tell you or if you put in practice the very things that they are teaching you, you will be financially successful or you will, uh, you know, become some sort of uh, model and you will look amazing and you will lose so much weight in, in, in a little time, etc. Promises. Vain promises. Nobody in this world has ever made any money without, you know, a work ethic and hard work, hard labor, hours and hours, days upon days of, of continually grinding hard in order to get somewhere. In the same way, nobody has ever uh, been able to lose weight and gain muscle and become some sort of, uh, you know, good sculptured body if they don't put the time and the dedication and if they don't put their appetite under control and they don't eat well, it will never happen. But these are just some examples of the things that you can see in this world. The things that rule and govern and, and, and dominate the life of so many hundreds and thousands, if not millions of people around the world. Or else, for example, social media. You can see nowadays how many people are just so trapped in social media, like they have to be checking their social media uh, update ever so often. If it's not this page, it's that page, or let's see what my friend said, or let's see the new message, or the new image, or the new um, whatever it is, video that somebody posted. It's all about entertainment. It's all about trying to keep people distracted from life, so that life becomes a little bit more sweet, perhaps. So that, you know, people kind of are probably distracted from their problems and issues of life, perhaps. But, let's be honest. Do people really post in social media the reality of their lives? Of course not. Everybody's always trying to give some sort of facade, some sort of appearance. But the reality is that when you take away that veil, and you get to actually know and see the real people, many people are broken. Many people's families, relationships, marriages, children, finances are broken, are in a bad state. And yet in social media, everybody seems to be doing fine. Everybody seems to have money. Everybody seems to be always happy. Everybody's always going on the newest holiday, etc. This world was designed to give you an appearance, but never to deliver true joy, true glory, true happiness, true fulfillment in life. This is the world that we're talking about. And this is the world that invades the mind of so many of us every single day of our lives. I mean, you don't have to look for it. It just comes to you fast and furious from the minute you wake up and you check your phone to the minute you go to sleep and you check your phone. From when you, when you, once you're working and, and you're doing something and yet you have something playing in the background or when you're driving and you see these billboards or you, you, know, you go to the garage and then you see the newspapers everywhere, just in every single direction you always have this continual bombardment from the world distracting you, keeping you busy to take away your peace, your joy. Tell me, how do you feel after a day in this world? Do you feel invigorated and 
you know, full of energy and full of love and full of peace and, and you know, you arrive home and you think, yes, you know, it was, it was an absolutely fantastic day and I still have loads more. Well, do you feel drained and tired and fed up and, and just, you just want to break? That's why many people uh, choose to have a hot bath or else a glass of wine or else just to, you know, dump their brains in front of a television because this world is so relentlessly attacking our minds every single day with news and reports and theories and all kinds of things, all kinds of scandals, images, feelings, emotions, you name it, is a continual non-stop bombardment that this world throws at us. Just to give you an example, how did people react when we all heard of this case of George Floyd and the whole Black Lives Matter thing? How did everybody react? Wasn't it like a, the power of media 100% just moving people just like that? The whole world became into an uproar because one person died. And I'm not justifying or I'm not saying that it was right or wrong. I'm just saying that the power that media had on the world can be so evident in something just like the case of George Floyd. And one wonders, why is it that so many people don't look for God? Because up here in their minds, they're in so much turmoil. Their minds are so distracted in so many things that when you ask people, for example, unbelievers, sometimes they can't even sort of keep a thought straight. They kind of wander all over the place. Some people are, 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 are very much like that. Like they talk about one thing and then they talk another and they talk about another. And and they never keep track of the one thing and one thing only for a long time. Or else people's ability just to kind of watch a video like this or else learn in a lecture that is probably an hour or two hours long. People get bored and get fed up and they start flicking their phones and people are distracted. Children. Children are so attacked by this world and they have such a short span for their attention, that, you know, it's, it's difficult even to keep children entertained and happy. Uh, it's not like the old days when there was not so much television and iPads and tablets and, you know, phones, etc., where people could take time to do things and, and life was not so fast. And people could take a drive and just enjoy the landscape, uh, enjoy the moments of peace and quiet. Nowadays, those moments are precious, are like valuable. They're like, they're like gold. Um, you know, people are so looking forward to have a, a, a little me time, a time of separating oneself from everyone else so that one can rest. I mean, isn't that hostile? What the world is doing is hostile against us people. There's no quietness, there's no peace, there's no rest, there's no joy. You see people are always buzzing, going place to place and always this urge because they have bills to pay and they have things to do and, and it's just go, 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 go. But what can we do? Because obviously this is an ongoing thing and it's not going to stop or slow down. So how do we approach this issue? Well, if you're not a Christian, you're not a believer, the Bible says that you are captive, enslaved. You're trapped and you cannot set yourself free. You're trapped to your flesh and the desires of it. You're trapped to the operations of the devil, there is no barriers that will stop him from influencing your life. And your, your life, your heart, your mind is just like an open door for the world to just do and influence you whichever way he wants. So unfortunately, if you are not a believer, 
you are in a place where you need to be set free. You need to recognize that you are indeed trapped and you need help. You need to repent from your sins. You need to ask God to forgive you. You need to ask Him to send His Holy Spirit to come and transform your heart, your mind. You need to ask Him to close those doors. You need to ask for power to fight against the flesh and against the devil and against this world. For God to renew your heart and your mind so that you can start again. Just become a new person. And that is only possible through the power of God in someone's life. So, if you are not a believer, you need to start there. If you have just become a believer, or else you have been a believer for quite some time, but you're struggling perhaps, you, you can't find that peace, that joy in life. You can't find that moment of just being with the Lord or, or having time to meditate. And, and maybe you read your Bible and you forget what you read, or, or maybe you're so, so bombarded in your mind that sometimes you just find it even difficult just to think you know, straight or, you know, your mind is all over the place and you don't know what to do about it. Well, let me read a few passages to you that are going to help you. But the key is going to be for you to know what the Bible says about how can you fight this war in your mind. So, I should recommend to you to read the Gospel of John, chapter 15, chapter 16, chapter 17. They are fully packed with Jesus' advice, teachings, and even his prayers for his disciples, for his followers. And in this chapter, specifically in chapter 16, as I'm going to be reading some verses of it right now, you will see that Jesus tells his disciples what they need to do in order to be set free and have peace in their minds. So the first thing is the Holy Spirit. This is a spiritual warfare. And in order to be victorious in this warfare, we need the help of the Holy Spirit of God. So if you haven't experienced the Holy Spirit in your life, you need to ask God to bless you, to anoint you, to, to fill you with His Spirit, so that you may be able to have Christ living inside your life, and then you will be able to conquer over your thoughts and your mind and the attacks of the devil and this world, etc. So John 16, verses 7 to 11, it says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. This is Jesus going away, back to heaven. For if I do not go away, the Helper, this is the Holy Spirit, will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father, and you will see me no longer. Concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. Did you notice how it says there, the ruler of this world is referring to Satan? And he says that he is already judged. But if you notice those verses, it says that Jesus himself said to his disciples that it was for their advantage that he will go away because then he will be able to send the Holy Spirit who will help them and be there guiding them and leading them and bringing conviction to this world of righteousness and judgment and sin. It says in verse 20 of the same chapter, John 6, 20, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn into joy. And then later on in verses 22 to 24, listen to what it says. So also you have sorrow now, but I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. In that day you will ask nothing of me. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Until now you have asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you will receive, that your joy may be full. 
So what the scripture is telling us here is that Jesus was telling his disciples that he was going to leave them. And because they felt like, what are we going to do now? They were going to feel sorrow. They were going to feel sad because Jesus was no longer going to be with them. But he's already told them that if he goes, he will send them the Holy Spirit. And what we see here is that this world produces this feeling of emptiness, this feeling of anxiousness, this feeling of, of anxiety, of not being able to, to cope with the demands and the things that are happening to us. It says that the disciples were, were going to lament and be sorrowful um, and this world will rejoice. It's interesting, isn't it? The more we advance in years, the more we see the increase of wickedness in this world. And the more we see the oppression, systematic oppression and, you know, attack against Christianity, against believers in Jesus Christ. But Jesus said to them, don't. Don't get oppressed. Don't be discouraged. Don't let this affect you. Don't lose heart. Don't be sorrowful. Because I will give you the joy. All you got to do is ask. Ask the Father in my name. So Jesus was telling his disciples that all they needed to do was to pray. To go to God in prayer and share their heart, their mind, everything that they were going through and ask in the name of Jesus. And he would give them joy, peace. He would turn their sorrow into gladness. How hard it is nowadays to even just spend some time in prayer. Precisely because our minds are so distracted with so many things that many people struggle even to pray as little as 10, 50 minutes, let alone half an hour or an hour. Some people struggle because this world is suppressing them, because this world is designed to take away Christ from everything and everywhere. And unfortunately, many people have drunk into this idea of the world and unfortunately their lives are going downhill. So do not be discouraged by pray. What else does, does it say? In verse 26-28 of the same chapter, John 16, it says, In that day you will ask in my name, and I do not say to you that I will ask the Father on your behalf, for the Father himself loves you, because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. I came from the Father and have come into the world, and now I am leaving the world and going to the Father. So Jesus was trying to encourage his disciples to help them realize that they need to have certainty. They need to understand that they were safe and they were loved by God and they were loved by him himself, and they did not need to fear anything because the love of God is everlasting. No matter what this world throws at you, the love of God does not change. So you need to have that certainty that God is the same yesterday, today and forever. He does not change. He will continue to love you and help you no matter what. Let's move on. In verse 33 it says, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. So Jesus is encouraging his disciples to take heart, to have peace, to not let the world overpower them, to not let their trials and tribulations and the, everything that this world will bring to their lives to make them crumble. He's saying, take heart, have faith, have strong um, joy in your life, have peace. And that's only found in God, obviously, in the relationship that we have with God, in having a clear mind, a clear conscience, is how we can have that peace. In the next chapter, John 17, verses 14 to 16, listen to what it says, and I'm about to finish. It says, Jesus was praying for his disciples, and he says, I have given them your word. And the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. 
I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake I consecrated myself, that they also may be sanctified in truth. Another very important tool that you can use in order to keep your mind and your heart stable is the Word of God. Jesus said in his prayer, I have given them your Word. and They are not of this world anymore. They are here and they are part of the world, but they are not of the world. Just as Jesus was here in this world, but yet he was not part of the system of this world. And then he says that they his desire was for them to be sanctified. So when a person knows the truth, when a person knows the Word of God, the person's desire is to sanctify oneself for the sake of God and for the sake of others. We become testimony. We become living open books for the rest of the world. And let me finish with this. In order for you to have victory in your mind, in your heart, in this fight that we have against the devil and against the world, you need to persevere. You need to fight. You need to stand. You need to resist. You need to not be overcome, but be an overcomer. Become salt and light. Bear witness. Give testimony. Talk to others about Christ. Let me finish with 1 John chapter 5, verses 1 to 5. It says, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of Him. By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and obey His commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments. And His commandments are not burdensome. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world and this is the victory that has overcome the world our faith who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God beautiful passage isn't it it's talking about how we can become overcomers and it talks about is being born of God having been born of God having been forgiven for our sins, having received the Holy Spirit, loving God and obeying His commandments, loving our brothers and sisters in Christ, doing the things that God commands us to do and not feeling overwhelmed or burdened by, by them. Also it says, these who have been born of God, those are the ones that overcome this world and the victory that we have is faith. It is through faith, it is in faith, it is by faith that we will overcome this world. Let me just pray and after that we close. Father, I thank you for the clarity that the scripture brings to our lives. I pray that you would indeed, Lord, help us to overcome this world. Help us to understand that we are already overcomers if we are your children and we live in truth and we have been saved and we have the Holy Spirit living inside of us. Help us to have faith and understand that this world has no authority, no power over us, but rather that we can overcome this world because you give us the power over our own minds. You give us the way out of every temptation, every tribulation. You help us to resist and to stand against the devil and all his wicked wiles. And Father, we know that in Christ we are safe. Because he has overcome this world, we will overcome this world too. Thank you, Lord, for your word today in Jesus' name. Amen. If this message has been a blessing to you, I'm sure it will be a blessing for someone else. So like it, share it, pass it around to your family and friends. May someone else be blessed by the Word of God. 
We'll wait for you here again next Sunday at 10.30 a.m. through our Facebook live stream or else go to our YouTube channel, like and subscribe so you can receive notifications of videos or visit our webpage disciplesschurch.co.uk where you can find much more biblical expositional material that will help you in your search of God and your walk of faith. May God bless you. Bye for now.